uh, while people are coming in. Um, this, is, uh, this talk is called Making It Fast, uh, The Power of Benchmarking. Um, my name's Cameron. Uh, I'm Cameron P. on Twitter and, and most other services, uh, including the Elixir Slack um, and GitHub, things like that. Um, I come from New York, and uh, I just really want to thank the organizers, actually, for having me here, because it gave me the excuse to come to Bangalore, which I just think is, is, has been fantastic. It's first time in India. And um, you might think that it's very different to New York, um, but uh, there are similarities. And uh, I have to say, I feel very comfortable right at home, walking across the street in this town. It's, uh, it's very, it all makes a lot of sense. Um, I write software. Uh, I've been writing software since 93, uh, working at Microsoft and uh, Real Networks and various other companies. I worked in C and Java later, uh, and then Ruby, um, and then more recently in Elixir. Um, but if I'm perfectly honest, um, I kind of, the last like eight or 10 years, I'm more managing people who write software um, and not writing so much in production myself. Um, but I try to uh, at least keep my hand in it and, and, and write things as much as possible. So three years ago, I started looking into Elixir and learning about it. And um, I got really, really excited about it and, uh, and, and started focusing on it. And in fact, uh, helped a few people uh, put together a conference in New York, which is called MPEX, which is a, the first regional Elixir conference in the United States um, and has now actually expanded. We're doing it in New York in May, and then we're also doing one in LA. Uh, Desmond Bowie was the original founder of MPEX, and he's moved to LA, and we're going to do a conference there. If anyone is interested in speaking at, at MPEX LA in February, their RFP is open, and you should hit them up. And with that, I end the self-promotion. So, making it fast. Um, so, when you talk about making something fast and improving performance and things of that nature, uh, you could be talking about a lot of different things. And, um, you know, you could be talking about, you know, optimizing the garbage collector and uh, little tricks that are dependent on your, on your language and your framework or whatever else. Um, hacks in the compiler, if you've built any Java code, you know, there's lots of stuff that you can do in the compiler. Um, and I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. Um, the stuff that I want to talk about is, is, is applicable, I think, more or less no matter what you're, what you're doing. And, and what I mean by that is I want to talk about the process of optimization and the, how, we, how we build that kind of thing into sort of a continuous process instead of being reactive, instead of saying, oh, I've done this thing and like, oh, crap, it's slow in production and uh, now let's fix it. You know, like can we build something into the process in the same way that we do have done with uh, uh, unit testing, continuous development, and stuff like that. Um, and so specifically, I'm going to be talking about benchmarking and how we can build that in. And a lot of what I'm going to say, I think, is, is applicable into, into different frameworks and languages. Uh, but I am going to be a little bit Elixir specific later, as you'll see. Um, so what do I mean by benchmarking? Um, <coughs> benchmarking is not profiling. Um, profiling, in my opinion, is, is something you tend to do reactively. You tend to say, OK, what's, this, this application is slow. And I need to find out why it's slow. And so you hook a profiler up to it. And depending on your, 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 uh, your language or your framework, that might be a, quite a big job. But you start looking at it. And you're doing it kind of reactively. And you do it, once you've done it and you say, OK, problem solved. Application is fast enough now. You, you probably put the profiler back on the shelf and don't touch it again for a while. Um, benchmarking is more like unit testing. And in that, in that I, I feel that it's something that you can do early in the process, not first. Not, it's not, we're not talking about benchmark first development here, but, but early enough in the process and continuously enough that it can kind of continue to hopefully yield dividends over time. It has certain characteristics, right? So benchmarking is granular. Gran benchmarking is not something you, you necessarily do at the very top level of code. You try to find, just like with unit tests, you try to find small pieces of code that you can, that you can, you can benchmark. It's repeatable. If I've got a benchmark test written, I can run that benchmark test again and again and again. And as I make changes to the code, I'm going to be able to I'm going to be able to see how those changes have affected my benchmarks. And it's relative. Whereas if you take something like a unit test, I mean, it either passed or it failed. You just you described a, an expected behavior. You either got it or you didn't. And it's true or false. I have a question. Yes.
Absolutely. Exactly the kind of thing I'm not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, it, it, depending on your framework, there may be really specific details exactly like that, where you need to, you need to make sure that you're actually benchmarking something that's, that's relevant. Um, and so, yeah, for sure. Um, I'll touch on something like that, but, but yeah, not going to get into the weeds too much there. Um, it's also relative. So, you know, the, the question of, uh, of, of relativity is, is that, you know, there's no such thing as a successful run in terms of the benchmarks. You never say, like, oh, yeah, that was fast enough. Because whether, fast, whether it is fast enough is totally dependent on your problem domain. But if something or if you'd make some change and something unexpectedly just got five times slower, that's actually pretty interesting, maybe. So it, to illustrate this, uh, I'm going to tell a short and slightly contrived story um, about performance. And uh, so here it goes. So when I, like, when I learn a new language, any language, um, I have a tendency to, to a lot of people uh, do like a big project and, and spend a couple of weeks on it. And um, I don't do that really. I, I like to do small problems. I, do like, I like to do small things that take me a couple of hours and uh, you know, or maybe a, you know, half a day or something, but not something that takes weeks. And I like to do kind of lots of them. And I find that I learn a lot faster that way. So I, that's, that's, that's what's my approach. Um, but I don't just sort of do the small problem and, and, and once I've successfully solved it, uh, call it a day. I, I try to treat it um, sort of professionally. I try to treat it seriously as I would if, as if I was doing the problem in a, in a professional context. So I do the small problem and then I refactor the small problem and then maybe I optimize the, the problem if it's, if it's relevant. And maybe I even do the documentation. And by doing that, I find that you learn um, about lots of bits and pieces of the language that you, that you might not necessarily uh, uh, del delve into otherwise. So where to get small problems? Um, there's lots of places, but I have a personal favorite, which I advocate to everybody who will listen to me, and that's a, a site called adventofcode.com. They've got loads of great problems on there, and um, it's, it's essentially, it's an advent calendar, which is like a thing we use for kids at Christmas time, starting on December 1st. And you get a new puzzle every day, um, and from the 1st to the 25th. And they get harder and harder. So the first few are easy, and then they get really, really hard at the end. Um, and so this story is about Advent of Code 2015. And this is what it looked like. And the problem that we're talking about is right there. Um, and that is December 6th, 2015, um, when I was received the following problem. And there's lots of sort of background to the problem. It's all sort of about Santa Claus and all sorts of crap. But um, I'll just sort of break it down simply. The problem is you have a 1,000 by 1,000 grid of lights that are addressable from the top left corner, 00, zero to 999999 in the bottom right corner. And they're controllable using special commands so that they give you an input file to, to parse. Um, and you're supposed to process the commands and figure out how many lights that are lit at the end. So this is a million lights. And the commands look kind of like this. So the commands are just kind of uh, turn off, and these are supposed to be rectangles. So turn off the lights from 660, 55, through to 986, 97, and that's supposed to be like a grid. Um, and it's supposed to turn off all those lights. And then it can turn them off, it can turn them on, and it can toggle them, right? And that you, you, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to process all of these commands, and there's like 25 or 30 of them. And at the end of it, you're supposed to count how many lights remain lit, and then you can enter that into the website, and it'll tell you whether you got it right or not. Now, to be honest, this is really not an ideal problem for Elixir. If you were, if you were actually solving this problem in a, in a professional setting, you probably would not reach for Elixir to solve this. You would also maybe ask yourself some questions about your job. But the reason why it's not great for Elixir is, first of all, it's a 2D array. And we don't got 2D arrays. Um, and second of all, it, it's mutating this giant data structure over and over and over again, which is not something that, that we do as efficiently uh, in Elixir as you might do in C or even Java or Ruby or something. Um, and it, it, by the nature of the problem, it, it's, you're not going to get any wins from concurrency by, by doing this. But we're not doing this to, to solve a real problem. We're doing this to learn. So we're doing it anyway. So the title of this talk comes from a sort of mantra that I did not invent, that I, but I've been saying it for years um, without knowing where it came from or it turns out exactly what it means. Um, but it's make it work, make it right, make it fast in that order. And 
in the course of researching it for this talk, I, I, which is weird because I've been saying it forever and I never looked it up, but it turns out that it's maybe Kent Beck, I'm not sure, um, probably Kent Beck. Um, seems like, let's say it was Kent Beck. It wasn't Einstein. So first of all, make it work. What does that mean? Well, make it work just means, okay, you've, get, you've been given the problem space. Do what you gotta do to solve the problem as quickly as possible, right? And, or maybe not as quickly as possible, but don't spend a lot of time thinking about performance. Don't spend a lot of time thinking about architecture. So you might have to throw it all away. But if that's the case, like why do that? Why go through that process of, of possibly throwing away code? And, and my feeling is what we're trying to gain from that is understanding. And so if you, if you go through that exercise and you do the, do the make it work exercise, at a minimum, you're gonna understand the problem space a little bit better than you did before. And maybe you'll have something that's worthwhile and maybe you won't, but if you do, even if you don't, you're gonna, at least, you're gonna at least personally understand a little bit better. So given the problem that I just showed you, let's take a look at the code that, uh, that I initially wrote uh, to do this. So, now I have to do a little bit of a jumping around here. Okay, so this is the code. This is the code for uh, for the thing that that I originally did. Is that big enough? Everybody can see. Yep. You want it bigger? Yeah. Nope. You're good. All right. So there's not much to this. I, I usually break problems down like this. Load. I lo load just loads the input file with all those commands. Process is the part that uh, is probably going to take up the, the most time. And then compute is just count how many lights at the end. And so. Uh, when I thought about it, I was like, God, how am I gonna do this, right? I don't have 2D arrays. I don't have anything like 2D arrays, really. And I, um, and I just don't really know what to do. And, and so I, I definitely don't, I know it's not a list of lists. That's not a good idea. Um, but, the, but the only thing I could come up with was a map where I've got like tuples representing the points, x, y, and then the value of the map is a, is, is a true or false or a one or a zero or something. Um, it doesn't feel right to me because the map is not a 2D array. Um, but I didn't have any ideas uh, other than that, so we went with it. So I implemented, this is what I did. So I implement this map. And if you look at uh, process, well, actually, let's look at load first real quick. So load, I'm not going to really delve into load too much because it's not that important. But it just, it just parses the file. And it, it just produces a bunch of uh, tuples like this where we have on, off, toggle, and then the, we've got this function parse range that pulls out, it parses the integers and it produces, it runs a regex and it parses the integers and it pulls out what our range looks like in terms of two points. So that's really all that does. So process, it just takes those commands that have been created by load and it reduces them into a map. And then, and then exec, it picks the appropriate it picks the appropriate uh, function based on the command. And if you look at what those functions do, oh, well, all they do is they, they find out all the points in the, in the range. It literally produces, takes, a, takes a, the two corners and produces a list of points. And, um, and then it, it turns in these on light and off light things, they just, uh, they just, they just mutate the map. That's all it, so that's all that's going on here. Um, it's not terribly elegant, but maybe it works, right? And so I thought, okay, well, that, maybe that's pretty good. So now, uh-oh. Are you kidding me? Oh, there we go. No. No, you can't help me with anything. Well, we're just going to have to do this hard way. So now that we've done it, uh, now that we've come through basically the code of uh, the, 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 the working code, and it, it worked, it ran, and it, it took a while. It took like 45 seconds or something like that, or a minute. So maybe not as good as it could be, but it's, you know, it worked. So I've kind of got it okay. So now it's about making it right. And when I looked into it, the concept of making it right was another thing that was open for debate about this mantra. Some people thought make it right 
meant handle all the edge cases and corner cases. And some people thought it meant refactor the code and make it architecturally sound, um, which is what I always thought it meant. Um, so I'm just going to say it's make it refactored. So it's make it work, make it refactored, make it fast. So let's quickly look at the refactored code. So the refactored code looks like this. Bear with me. So all I've done here, really, I did some small refactorings to remove a bit of duplicated code, which I won't really go into. Nothing really major. But the main thing that I've done here is I've separated the file into three parts. And this is going to turn out to be important. So I st I'm still happy with load process compute. But I've moved everything that relates to the map into one section of the file. And I've, and I've basically said, OK, this here could potentially be extracted from this file. You could potentially move this into another module. I'm just holding off doing that for the time being because I tend to like to, to push that back. But now I've taken the piece of code that I'm most suspicious about that I think, you know, I'm now I'm preparing effectively to make it fast. And I'm also preparing to benchmark it. And so, uh, so that's really all I've done. Um, I've made some, I've removed some duplication uh, in, uh, in the way that command processing worked, but that's all. And so what to do next? So. Next thing to do is make it fast. Now, <laughs> years ago, there was a product called Foxbase, uh, which most of you are probably too young to remember. But Foxbase was like a version of another product called DBase, which m most of you are definitely too young to remember. But it, it, but it was exactly like DBase, but it was like 10 times faster, like literally 10 times faster at everything. And the guy who wrote it was interviewed and, and asked, like, you know, what did, how did you make it 10 times faster? And he said, oh, I just took out the slow parts. Um, which is, yeah, that's great, man. So, so yeah, just take out the slow parts and you're going you're gonna to be, you're going to have a much faster program. So this is where benchmarking turns out to be a big win because it allows us to identify what the slow parts are. So I use something called Benchvela. Um, there are many benchmarking toolkits out there. Um, this one I like mainly because it's simple. It's not super feature rich, um, but it's got enough, and you, but you can get going with it really quickly. And it's really analogous to the way test unit works. So you, it, it sort of feels right in, in terms of my whole benchmarking unit testing dichotomy. So you, you just, yeah, you, you put this in your depths in your MixEXS. And um, it, you have to create a folder called bench underneath, um, underneath the root of your project, inside of which your benchmarking tests are going to go. Now. Uh, I wanted to make one more change, which is we had this big list of inputs with all of these commands. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want something that's going to take 45 seconds when I'm doing my benchmarking any more than you want your unit tests to take that long. I want my benchmarks to happen a little quicker than that. So I've made like a simplified version of this. It has lo smaller numbers and has fewer commands. And so hopefully my benchmarks are going to run a little quicker. So let's see how it goes. All right. I'm going to have to load another thing. Right. So what we have here is I've added the bench uh, directory, and we have this lights bench EXS. And so as you can see, we've just, we're just touching the top level, right? So you could get really granular with this and benchmark loads of things. But just for now, I'm just going to benchmark the top level, and we're going to see which part is slow. Um, so we've got load, which we probably think is not going to be very slow. We've got process, which we, we suspect is going to be very slow indeed. And we've got uh, compute, which is the adding up at the end, which is also potentially slow. You don't know. Um, and so now once we run this, we're going to be able to see which one's slow, which one's not slow. And so all you do is just type mixbench, and it runs the three things. And it's basically running these, these, these functions as many times as it can in the kind of allowable time frame. 
And sure enough, to no one's surprise, load is very fast at 100 microseconds per op. Compute is also very fast, a little quick, a little slower, but still 267 mics an op. And process is the slowest by far. So process is the slow part. And process is the thing that's dealing with that giant map where we really want a 2D array. Um, so, well, that's great, but um, <laughs> what now, right? So, like, I, it's not like it's not like I suddenly have 2D arrays. So, I thought about this for quite some time, and, and mostly I kind of uh, I think I just Googled this one, and uh, and once again, Erlang OTP just has all the things, and. Here in the Erlang library is a module called Array. Um, I don't know how many of you have like delved into the Erlang standard lib, but uh, you just should. Just, just go into this Erlang standard lib and look at all of the things that are available in there and you'll be, you'll be amazed uh, at, at some of the stuff that's, that they've got like directed graphs, they've got, they've got stuff you wouldn't believe is in the standard lib. But one of the things they have is this array. And I see this and I'm like, oh, this is it, this is the business. Um, it's gonna be functional extendable arrays, it's gonna be fast, it's like optimized, here it is. And uh, the only, there was a couple problems with it. One is that it only supports one dimensional arrays. Um, but I said, all right, well I'll just have a one dimensional, I'll have an array of arrays and then I'll just have two lookups and maybe, we'll be, maybe it'll be quicker. So let's see how that looks. So now we've done a bunch, I've done a bunch of things here. Um, one thing that I've done is I've moved the, uh, I've moved the, the persistence layer actually into its own module so that I can have a map grid and an array grid. Map grid being the original one and array grid being the one that's implemented using the Erlang array. And the Erlang array is just exactly the same. Um, It's just exactly, wow, that is, can I make it a little smaller? No. All right. It basically just implements exactly the same methods that we implemented for, for the map from before. But it just, it, it just calls this colon array module and, it, call, and it, it calls get to get the rows and it, and it calls set to set the things. And we've had to turn a bunch of stuff around because it's Erlang and the object goes at the end. Um, but basically this is exactly the same implementation as we had before. It's just a different, it's just a different underlying persistence model. And so, the other thing that I've done, actually, I should show you. Um, is I've added, I've changed these, uh, these uh, benchmarks so that they can either use a map or they can use the array grid optionally. So now I'm going to be able to have benchmarks that, um, that, that, that compare and contrast kind of what's going on. And I've got, so I've got process using an Erlang array, process using compute using map. Etc. So, what happens when we run mix bench here is it now it now goes through all of this process and it's running all of these things. And at this point, I am super optimistic. I'm like, this is going to be awesome, right? Like, I can't wait to see how much faster it's going to be when I when I've used the the Erlang built-in array thing instead of the map. And I don't know if you can see that, but um, it's. Uh, substantially slower with the array uh, than it was with the map. And th like the level of disappointment here I can't even begin to convey because I was, I was so excited about how this was going to work and I was like, wow, Erlang has everything and then it's slower. But I was like, well, since I've come this far, um, <laughs> well, let me show you. Um, so, yeah, that was me. I'm like, no. So, but I said, like, since I've come this far, let me at least just try to run the problem with the two things. Now this first line up here is, is 35 seconds. That's the original way with the map. But then the second line is 18 seconds using the array. So despite what the benchmarks were just telling me, it's faster. It is faster, right? It's 100% faster. So I'm like, well, what's, what's wrong? Why, is it, why did my benchmarks just come up with nonsense right there? 
All right, so how to think about that. And if you remember, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have the preview here, so things are surprising me. Um, if you remember, I kind of, I'd put like, I'd, I'd simplified this by shrinking the number of lines, but I'd also shrunk the number of numbers. Uh, I'd shrunk the numbers so that the effect of it was that I wasn't just doing fewer operations. Um, my map was smaller by a, by a lot. And so th that small map was, was having a substantial impact on, um, on the performance, which shouldn't really be a huge surprise, but it didn't occur. So let's change this so that we, so that we can have um, a, a sort of real map. And so that is checking out master. OK. So in this case, what I've done is I've added a new input, which is a bit more realistic, which is, which, is, which is big numbers, four things, but big numbers should create a big map. And I put that in bench about two. And then I've also, I also need to make a change to the um, bench file to make sure that it loads that one. So if we go down here and bench about two, right now we're going to test this. We're going to run this benchmark with a little bit better realistic data, maybe. Right? And we'll see what happens now. And lo and behold, um, now Erlang Array is substantially quicker. It's, it's interestingly, it's, uh, it's a little slower for compute, but it it's that slowness for compute is more than made up for by how much faster it is for the process part. So the mutation is, for whatever reason, a lot quicker. But the important thing to realize is somewhere in between these two sizes of maps, there's a sweet spot, right? And so the, whether or not the right thing to use for you for this kind of problem is a map or an Erlang array is entirely dependent on, on your program. And only really something like benchmarking uh, with, with realistic data can tell you that. So in this case, this is, all right, this is explaining why I was seeing the behavior I was seeing, where it was working. So, actually, I want to show you a couple other things. Um, I can't demo this live because it, requi it actually requires the internet, um, and I don't trust it. But uh, there's a few other little uh, features of Benchfella that are worth looking at. So one thing is that Benchfella puts some um, snapshots. Every time, you run, every time you run a benchmark, it creates these snapshots of the last time you ran it. And you can compare uh, the, the, this snapshot to the previous snapshot. And I think you can make it generate warnings when, um, when, snap, when things in the snapshots get so significantly slower, uh, which is really useful. And the other thing that it, it can create is graphs. And this is the thing that requires the internet. But you can just say uh, mix. I'm not going to do it because it will break things. But, but you can just say mix bench graph. And it will, it will compare, it will either produce the last snapshot or you can make it compare the last two snapshots and it'll show all of your, all of your stuff. Pretty neat. Um, and I did it earlier, so hopefully you can see it. So this, whoa, holy crap. <laughs> right, so this is what, um, this is what uh, the graph of the first run looked like where we were just using the map. And we've got compute and you can see it's very clear that process is the, is the, is the issue. And then this was uh, the one where uh, we had all five. We're computing using an Erlang array. Um, and you can see, com this is compute using map. And you can see that it's, it's slower, it's, it's faster rather than the Erlang array. But this is process using Erlang array. And it's, it's, uh, it's considerably quicker. No, it's not. I'm not sure what the hell's going on. Um, it shouldn't be that way. But in any event, you can generate graphs. Um, so, back to the slides. So, yeah, like I said, the important thing is the size of your data matters to some extent. So you want to simplify maybe, but don't oversimplify. So my tips for benchmarking uh, and the importance of benchmarking is that you should be writing your benchmarks early, um, but not first. So first get it working, first get it into a state where it's it's where you would be comfortable maintaining it, or your team would be comfortable maintain of it, maintaining it, then build your benchmarks. Simplify the inputs sufficiently that, uh, that, you've, uh, that you've got benchmarks that you're not 
afraid to run all the time that you might maybe be willing to automate or make part of a um, continuous integration process, but not too simply. And if you're seeing weird behaviors where the benchmarks are just not agreeing with the production behavior, well, then you need to think about what's wrong with my benchmark. Something is clearly not representative in my benchmarks. And keep running them all the time. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say. Um, like I said, I'm Cameron P. on all the various services. And um, are there any questions? Nope. Thank you very much.